Hi. Normally don't have a video call to worship, but today I wanted to give one. Uh, last week I was on vacation, and though it was a strange time to be on vacation, and, and something uh, as we approach Sunday that continued to come onto my mind was how when we gather, even remotely and digitally like this, we're we're placing our time and our energy and our emotion towards the praise of God, the maker of heaven and earth. And it's not a distraction from the world. Uh, it's not even um, a fleeing from the circumstances of the world. But we come to worship Jesus and we come to praise him because we live in the world. Because we both see the miraculous sunsets and the mountains and we see and we know the work that God has done in the world, specifically in Jesus. But we also come because we see the havoc and the destruction and the pervasive sin and evil that impacts every part of our lives. And so we come to worship. But that's hard to do. It's really hard to do when we see sin abound, when we see racism abound, when we see uh, racism steal the lives of others, when we see people dying on the streets in videos. It seems hard to worship Jesus when justice and repentance and forgiveness and true reconciliation in our country seems so far and so distant. I want to call us to worship today with a single word. Uh, it's a word in the Psalms. It's nevertheless. It's actually just a singular letter in Hebrew, vav. And mostly, uh, it just signals the start of a new sentence, a new idea. It's your basic run-of-the-mill and or but or so. But every now and then, it's coupled with a few sentences. Uh, a, a few, a few uh, parallel couplets, if you're into Shakespeare, right before. And it, and it marks the turn of something paradoxical. It's placed to show the shift of the unlikely. For example, when things are really bad, when things seem quite hopeless, when days are evil, when society is unjust, nevertheless, God is with us. The Bible, except for a few instances, the whole of the scriptures is written in the context of injustice. It's written about people experiencing injustice, or it's written from prisons, it's written from deserts, it's risen from caves, and yet, <clears throat> it's filled with these words calling us to worship. The prophets cried out for justice and were mostly ignored as society continually looked less and less how God designed humanity. And yet, the prophets give us miraculous words of praise to God, miraculous visions of God. Kings leaders, judges, all came and go, music leaders, psalmists came and lived in the shadows. The people themselves of the scriptures were mostly a forgotten nation or forgotten people amidst empires. Their homes burned, their, city, their cities lay just as stumps. Nevertheless, praise. Nevertheless, praise. Something for us to do as we seek to be voices of justice and true reconciliation, where not only are things put right, but things are put whole, where forgiveness and grief is all consumed in the hope and the blessing of God. That's that's the longing, and that's a long road way beyond this week, way beyond this year, way beyond a pandemic, way beyond changes to our laws.
And yet right now we lie in this place where we see wickedness. Nevertheless, praise. Psalm 73 is the psalm where this word comes up. In the beginning, the psalmist uh, writes about how uh, he's just struggling to see how the wicked and the systems of, of evil sort of operate in society. And while people do injustice, they're actually raised higher and higher in society. And so the injustice grows and grows and grows. He even talks about how they scoff at God while their mouths lay claim to heaven in verse 9. While they claim these words for heaven, it says, their tongues take possession of the earth. It talks about how people get consumed in this and they turn towards it for safety. They live as if God isn't real and they treat other people that way. And the psalmist is trying to understand how can God continue to allow that to go on? And then in verse 16, he says, when I tried to understand all this, it troubled me deeply. Some translations say it exhausted me. When I tried to understand the wickedness and the evil, it exhausted me. And then verse 7, it says, until I entered the sanctuary of God, and then I understood destiny. Then he understood that God was going to deal with all of these things. That God was going to, to handle and, and remove wickedness and evil and justice. And the psalmist even goes on and, and describes how when his heart was grieved, when his spirit was embittered in verse 21, when I didn't understand and when I was ignorant, talking about ignorant of the wickedness and even complicit in it. I was a brute beast before you. He's talking about how he, be, he, was, he was not worthy to be with God. And then it comes, verse 23. Nevertheless, you were with me always. Nevertheless, you held me by your right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will take me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. It says God will destroy wickedness. But as for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge, and I will tell of your deeds. What happens in the psalm is he takes the burdens and the wickedness into the sanctuary of God, and then he sees not just the wickedness more clearly, but he sees himself very clearly, and he sees the brokenness of himself. And Jared's written a confession for us today that will lead us to see that. And then he begins to praise and look to God and understand that all along God has been in pursuit of him and in pursuit of justice right alongside him. And then he walks away from the praise and the worship of God with strength, with the clinging on to what's most precious, the very presence of God, but with a strength and, a, and an energy and a vitality to see and to walk clearly in this world. So I want to call us to worship today with this word, nevertheless. It's hard to conceive worshiping God. Nevertheless, let's go to the sanctuary, the place of God, and he might do something in us and speak something to us that would give us the strength and the clarity and the wisdom and the courage to walk in faith. Amen. Let's worship Jesus.